So yeah, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for being here. Um, I'm not wrong. I'm not John Roncaroni. Um, I decided not to change that because I don't know, John might, John's doing a couple of these trainings and I'm doing some of them. So uh, anyways, so I just want to be clear about the topics we'll talk about. I've mixed up my slides just a little bit for this year, um, partially because it's on a webinar format. And um, we're going to go over the basics of the UC pesticide policy and what it means. Um, we're going to talk about uh, procedures for conducting pesticide research trials, um, talking about tolerant uh, food use tolerances and crop destruct, some groundwater protection regulations, training requirements for you and your staff, um, talking uh, specifically about uh, the rules surrounding field work during pesticide applications, and we'll go over supervisory responsibilities in the context of pesticide applications. Um, uh, towards the end of the training, if we have time, we'll take a, take a vote on which of these optional topics that we want to talk about. Um, so keep in mind, you know, like if there's something on this list that you think that you'd like to hear about, you'd like us to talk about, um, you'll have the opportunity to give your opinion on which one we should cover towards the end, once we've covered all the required topics. So I'm going to go into the basics of the UC ANR pesticide policy. I do want to make just one comment. Um, so this is in the UC ANR policy and procedure manual. It's um, a section 281, I believe. Um, and I could put a link in the chat at some point in time. Um, but it's been recently updated. I worked really hard um, with Jim Farrar and Catherine Montano to update this policy. And it was mostly just to clean up language, um, remove uh, verbiage that was just repeating pesticide regulations that had changed and were no longer applicable or th that were just different. So, um, you know, hopefully this policy is much more user friendly and it gives more uh, specific instruction about selecting PPE and things like that. So, when we're doing research with pesticides, so um, Sarah put a link in the chat, but the title of the policy is uh, Policy on Pesticides and Related Chemicals, so for experimentation and demonstration. So um, we're going to talk, you know, first about all the things that you have to do as a researcher using pesticides, the ways in which you can conflict with a, a registered label and the ways in which you cannot, okay? So as a researcher, we have the right to conduct this research. And we also have corresponding responsibilities to do no harm and to conduct intellectually honest research. Um, I really don't have any hesitation saying that we, that we do that here. So anytime you're making pesticide applications, particularly in a research setting, there are risks and liabilities involved. And so, you are responsible as, as a person responsible for the research, you're responsible to manage these risks and to mitigate them whenever possible. And, you know, it's not just to cooperators and to the public, but there are risks to yourself and to your staff. So please keep that in mind. Um, these are pesticides, even if they're lower toxicity products, they're pesticides. And so um, let's just treat them with the respect that they deserve and make sure that we're taking all the precautions that are required. Um, so the policy tells us that all research, published pest management guidelines, and recommendations relating to pesticide use must be used and conducted in accordance with all applicable laws, regulations in this policy. So um, there are laws, federal and state laws and regulations that govern pesticide use, and many of them we, ha we have to follow, right, even though we're researchers. But this policy does sort of exempt us from a few things, but not everything. You still are going to have to do things like um, train your employees and wear the appropriate personal protective equipment. Okay, but we're allowed to sort of go against the label in certain respects um, for the purposes of research. Um, okay. So the scope of the policy, it's a and R employees or UC employees um, who use pesticides for experimental purposes. It's actually not restricted to A and R employees because 
Um, the policy does include ag experiment station faculty and, and personnel. So um, it's not just ANR, although a lot of this pesticide research is conducted in, in accordance with, you know, in connection with ANR. Um, but it talks about, it covers you when you're doing um, pesticide research in any field test or even a field demonstration. So that does allow you to use experimental pesticides or registered pesticides in an experimental way. Um, in a field demonstration when you're trying to um, show efficacy or a new method um, to the public to um, encourage them. So the pesticide policy applies to us, whether we're on campuses, field stations, research and extension center, or even off UC property when we're working with cooperators. And our cooperators can be like private growers, um, but they can also be public land like BLM or parks or something like that. So it's basically you're on UC property or you're on cooperators land. That's like two major distinctions. So technically the ANR policy does not include pesticide use in a greenhouse or a laboratory. So pesticide use in these facilities still have to follow federal state and local laws and regulations, but it's not, the use is not mandated by this policy. The use isn't, the rules and regulations about um, applying in a greenhouse or laboratory aren't covered in this policy. You can still do research, um, but here's the thing, it's, it's just another, or it's like Brian Oatman's group that's gonna tell you what you can and can't do in the lab and in the greenhouse. Um, so if you have some specific questions on that, I might have to refer you to Brian, but basically I was always told by my predecessor, Rick Melnico, um, that in a greenhouse or a lab, you just, you treat your greenhouse like a lab. So however you deal with pesticides in your lab, that's how you're going to deal with them in your greenhouse. And they become part of your chemical hygiene plan. So whatever chemical inventory that you maintain, you know, in that greenhouse, in that lab, then you would do the same in the greenhouse. And you treat pesticides like they are um, one of your other chemicals. I mean, pesticides are chemicals, they're just special. Um, and so you still, you know, all applicable laws and regulations still apply to you, however. But anyway, so sometimes it can be tricky because some people do research in a lab and then they move into a greenhouse and then they move it into a field situation. Hey Lisa, we have one question about what if we'll be addressing pesticide application near schools today. Um, I don't think that I have that planned, but if there's time, I'm happy to address it. I'll have to sort of search for that handout. I have a handout that might help you. Um, or we can talk offline about that. So um, if there are other people who are interested in um, talking about pesticide application in areas close to schools, then when we get to that poll towards the end, if that's not on the poll, I don't really remember at the moment because uh, there's too many things in my brain, um, then you can, I'll ask you to put that in the chat so then I can you know, get a sense for if there's a lot of people who wanna hear about that, we can talk about that in lieu of one of the other topics. So thank you for that question. So uh, the first poll, let before, we're sitting here talking about pesticides. So what's a pesticide? Sarah's gonna launch that poll for us. Okay, so the first poll is asking, uh, which of the following are considered pesticides in California? And you can choose all of the responses that you see fit. Uh, so we have insecticides, adjuvants, pheromones for mating disruption, pheromones for monitoring pests, plant growth regulators, herbicides, fungicides, and clove oil. So which of those are considered pesticides in California? And let's share the results. So Lisa, I'll let you respond. <laughs> Um, okay, so 100% um, of the respondents said that insecticides are pesticides. I mean, obviously, right? Um, adjuvants in California do have to be registered. Now, keep in mind, um, to, the, to my knowledge, those are not, I mean, they're not in general uh, registered by EPA. There might be a couple of um, exceptions because of the way they work, but they do have to be registered in California. So they will have a California registration number. Um, so if you are using pheromones, 
Um, there are two primary uses for pheromones, and one of them is considered a pesticide and one of them is not. So pheromones for mating disruption, that's a pesticide. Whereas pheromones, you know, just the traps for monitoring pests, that is not considered a pesticide. Which is just to say that a pheromone that is used for mating disruption um, is going to require a registration or an exemption for a from a registration. And if you don't have those two things, it becomes experimental. And that's fine. I actually, I think I'm going to advance my slide um, just so you can see the poll and maybe some of the words at the same time. But I still want to share this. So um, plant growth regulators are registered in California as pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, obviously, we all know this. And then clove oil, although it's you, it is a pesticide. So this one is like the trick question in the bunch. Clove oil, it, depending on how you're using it, it could be used as a pesticide, but it happens to be exempt, federally exempt from the requirement of a registration. It's one of those 25B products. And so it is a pesticide, but there are certain things that don't apply because it's not registered. So um, like you don't have to report pesticide use. So we can talk about that. So um, really it's like the intent of the use of the product. So it's pretty clear if something has an EPA registration number, it's a pesticide, right? So I, I think we understand that very well. Um, but then there are just these other nuanced things that are either, um, you know, based on intent of use or there because we're in California, right? So again, adjuvants not registered by EPA, but uh, registered here in California, pheromones, um, plant growth, growth regulators, and anything that's maybe not traditionally considered a pesticide, but that you're using it to kill a pest. And so it's any chemical or whatever that you're using to defoliate a plant, to regulate plant growth, to prevent, destroy, mitigate, kill a pest. Okay, if you're trying to use it like you would use a registered pesticide, then it's a pesticide and you have to treat it like one. So some materials that are pesticides that some people don't really realize that, you know, Clorox and then, you know, disinfectants and sterilizers, you know, for benches, countertops, COVID, um, those are all pesticides. Um, I, I don't know if anybody's actually doing research on those. I mean, you can use them, it's fine. But if you're doing research with them, I just want you to recognize that they are pesticides and that you would have to treat it like such. Um, algicides, animal repellents, certain pheromones, as we mentioned. And so in general, for these uses to be, you know, non-experimental and not in conflict with the label, everything that you do has to be supported by a label. And so if you don't have an EPA registered label and a California registered label that you're following all the instructions, that means you're likely using the pesticide in conflict with the label which means it's probably an experimental use. And that's fine. You just have to make sure that you're following this policy when you do that. So Lisa, um, there's a question in the Q&A that, that's a great segue for that question. They're asking if the label is registered through APA, but not Cal in California, um, can they do experimental research? Yeah. Uh, that's a great question. So um, if you do, I mean, and we'll get to that. I probably am getting ahead of myself, but I'll just skip through that slide when I get there. Um, so if there is a pesticide that's registered by EPA, but it's not yet registered by California or not, in, you know, not submitted for registration, whatever. If it's registered by EPA, but not here in California, it is considered experimental use, but it is still a little different. If you have a federal label, there's, a, there's you know, certain exceptions to certain things. So we'll get there, but it is technically considered experimental. Okay. Hey, Lisa, there's another question in the chat. It's asking, um, is alcohol considered a pesticide if it's used to disinfect pruning tools? Um, isopropyl alcohol, yes, it is. But Great. it's not in, but my understanding, my interpretation of that is it's not an experimental pesticide use. It's just a pesticide and that's fine. You have to follow the label instructions. You need to wear appropriate PPE. You need to wash your hands you know, um, whatever, but it is technically a pesticide. It's, you know, um, lots of disinfectants are, um, the active ingredient is isopropyl alcohol 
and other things that you wouldn't necessarily consider a pesticide, but if you're using it um, to kill probably microbes or germs or virus particles or plant pathogens or something like that. So it is, but my interpretation is that you're not using it in an experimental way. So just follow the use instructions. So an experimental pesticide um, can be a brand new pesticide, right? Okay, it's a numbered compound. We don't have any kind of label for it at all, right? That is, that's clear. Or it could be like a new formulation. Somebody is developing a new formulation for the same active ingredient that is already registered in different ways, right? So um, new products containing old active ingredients, like not, it's not just a number compound that's an experimental pesticide, okay? Basically, if no federal or and California label exists, it is an experimental pesticide. Or if you have a label that's registered here in California, but you're not following the directions, right? So you're using it in conflict with the label. That means and it's, it's an experimental pesticide use, okay? And just to be clear, um, um, Josephina Farmer down the road or your local parks person, they can't use pesticides in the same way that you can. Okay, they have to be working with the researcher that either has a research authorization or works under this pesticide policy or a similar pesticide policy. So that's the distinction. Think in your head. Okay, can my colleagues at the parks department make this application? No, they cannot. Okay, that's experimental. Okay, so then I have to make sure I'm following the policy. So the last thing on here is if you're using this in conflict with the California or an EPA registered label, it's experimental. So let's talk about what in the world is use in conflict. Um, so we're going to launch this poll. Okay, so the this poll is asking which of the following are considered use in conflict with the California approved label. And again, on this one, you can choose all the ones that you think apply. So the options are, I'm using a rate that is higher than what the label tells me to use. I'm using a rate that is lower than what the label tells me to use. I'm using a labeled rate on a crop that, it's listed on, that is listed on the label. I'm using a labeled rate on a crop that is not listed on the label. I am harvesting before the pre-harvest interval has passed. And last but not least, I am harvesting after the pre-harvest interval has passed. So which of those are considered use in conflict with a California label? All right, but I'm gonna end it and I'm gonna share the results. All right, Lisa, take it away. Okay, so, okay. I'm going to just talk to the talk to the poll. So let's go through these 95% um, of you. So use and conflict, right? It means I have a registered label, but I'm not following the right instructions. So to be clear, if you have a use and conflict, that makes it an experimental use. Okay. And, and you can do that. I mean, we have this privilege that we have this policy and it allows us to do that. So if you are using a rate that is higher than what the label tells me to use, that is an experimental use. And so 95% of you knew that, and I applaud you. So if you are using a rate that is lower than what the label tells you, that's not actually experimental. It's not in conflict um, because you're backing off of the label. You can't exceed the label rate, but you can um, do a lower label rate. Oftentimes it's not really recommended or a good practice just for pesticide resistance purposes, but it certainly doesn't make it an illegal application. So if you are using a labeled rate on a crop that's listed on the label, it's not experimental, it's not use in conflict. You may be incorporating it into your trials either as an industry standard or just you know, just to test the efficacy and that's fine, but it's not use in conflict. So it's not considered an experimental pesticide use. Um, I am using a labeled rate, but I'm doing it on a crop that's not actually covered by the label. That's experimental. That's use in conflict. Um, so then you have to treat it like an experimental pesticide application. If you are harvesting before the pre-harvest interval, 
that is experimental. So I would like somebody, anybody, all of you in the chat to tell me what, what I mean by the pre-harvest interval. So let's define this term before I quiz you on it. Maybe I should have done that before, but um, put a, you know, tell me in the chat what you think uh, the pre-harvest interval means, what it means to you. I'm getting a lot of good responses. Yeah, these look, these look great. Um, so it means um, the time that has to elapse between your last pesticide application of the season and when you harvest that commodity, okay? So um, if you are harvest, so if your pre-harvest interval is seven days and you're harvesting six days after the application, you are using that pesticide in conflict with the label. And that just makes it an experimental use. But maybe you're, you know, doing a test. Can we harvest early? But if you're harvesting after that seven day interval, it's totally fine. That's not use in conflict. Um, basically, if you're doing anything that's mucking around with the amount of uh, pesticide residues that are, um, uh, if you're increasing the amount of out, um, active ingredient per unit area per season, or if you're mucking around with the amount of residues that are going to be on that field at the uh, on that commodity at the end of the season, then it's use in conflict. So it does include it does not include I'm sorry, applications at lower than label rates, less frequent application intervals. So for example, if the retreat interval is every 14 days and you want to retreat every 20 days, totally fine. But if the application retreat interval on the label is 14 days and you want to do it every seven days, that is use in conflict. Okay. So tank mixes, there, I mean, not all appropriate tank mixes are listed out on the label. Typically, in some labels actually say, oh, this is good when tank mixed with this other product. But there's not, you know, an exhaustive list of all of the tank mixes that you could use with this product. But sometimes there is um, a notation on the label that says, do not tank mix with this product or with this active ingredient. So if you decide to tank mix with something that's prohibited on the label, um, then that's use in conflict. But usually it's prohibited because there's some kind of like negative interaction between the chemicals. So I would really think twice about that. Um, so if you want to use pests, that pesticide against pests that are not on the label, it's actually not use in conflict, okay? So if you have, uh, this ha has happened recently with some citrus pesticides because of uh, the Asian citrus psyllid is a new and emerging pest. And so that wasn't necessarily on all the insecticide labels. So it's actually not use in conflict if you're following all label directions, including the label rate for similar insects, you can use it to target a pest that's not on the label, okay? You have to just make some good educated decisions. So if you increase the concentration of a mixture, um, as long as you're applying the same amount of active ingredient per unit area, if that recommendation is published in one of our pest management guidelines, then it's not use in conflict. So that just means you can put out less water per acre, right? But you, or per unit area, because you're not always applying on an acre basis. Um, but as long as the amount of active ingredient per unit area it is not increased. Okay. So any questions on use in conflict with the label? Is there another situation that we didn't cover that might be using conflict and you want to talk about it? We have a question since you defined PHI, how you would define harvest. <clears throat> um, For example, shaking, shaking nut crops or, or picking or. <laughs> I believe that re when you remove the commodity from where it's growing, that is the definition of harvest. I can look at the regulatory definition, uh, but that's that would be my definition. I guess it's a little bit unique in um, nut crops where you're shaking them, but you don't remove them from the field. But it is the time when you remove it from the tree. That's my definition. Just like you know, broccoli. Once you cut that head, then that's harvested. Because if there are, um, and it, it's because of this, because if your pesticide, for example, is systemic and it's moving through the plant tissues, 
um, and just sort of disintegrating in that way, you know, because pesticide residues disintegrate over time. Once you cut, um, once you remove the almond from the tree or cut the broccoli from the plant, it can no longer, you know, it's that part is no longer living. It's essentially no longer living. It's not getting any food or water from the main plant. So that's, to me, that's harvest. Because it has everything to do with the pesticide running through the pest the plant tissues. So any, any follow-up questions on that? Yeah, we have a question from George about grape leaves um, midsummer. Is that harvest? Oh, taking grape leaf. Uh, desojando. How do you say that in English? Removing the leaves. If it's just the leaves and it's not something that people are going to, if people are actually eating the grape leaves, then yeah, that's harvest. But if they're not, no, it's not harvest. It's so it's whatever part that somebody is actually going to consume, either eat or drink or, you know, whatever, um, or feed to an animal. It's that part of the plant that comes off um, that makes it harvest. So if you're just um, deleafing, I don't know how to say it in English, I'm sorry. Um, if you're just deleafing for, you know, powdery mildew prevention or what have you, then no, that's not harvest. It's just deleafing. Okay, any other questions? Okay, so let me know. Um, if you have other, you know, harvest questions or use and conflict questions, like if, do you want to give me a scenario and ask if it's use and conflict? I'd love to hear it. Um, so, cause we've just laid, um, laid down the basics for what you have to do when you conduct pesticide research trials. Okay. So we're going to launch another poll. Um, okay. So this poll is asking um which of the following is true when you are conducting experimental pesticide research trials at uc and again choose all that you think apply so you need a research authorization from dpr um i need a federal experimental use permit i need a restricted materials permit um, and lastly i have to report pesticide use so that means submitting a pesticide use report so which of those um, do you think is true when you are doing pesticide research trials with UC? Okay, thank you. So, okay, let's go through each of these. So if I'm a UC employee and I'm covered by this UC pesticide policy, do I need a research authorization from DPR? Most of the time, the answer is no. We're essentially exempted from the majority of the RA processes because we have this policy, okay? And then the um, a federal experimental use permit, most it's kind of like the federal equivalent of a research authorization. Although the both the pesticide policy and the research authorization, like they tap, they top off at 10 acres. So you would only need an experimental use permit if you were putting out these experimental research trials on um, more than 10 acres. And I can talk more about the nuance of what the 10 acres means. Um, so in general, we don't need a research authorization. Most of the time, we do not need an experimental use permit. Um, most of the time, we do not need a restricted materials permit. Technically, our policy exempts us from the requirement of a restricted materials permit if we are applying restricted material, if, you know, if we're applying restricted materials. However, I've been informed it's very difficult to purchase restricted materials if you do not have a permit, which is exactly the way it's designed to be because you don't want just anybody purchasing those materials. So what I've been told is that a lot of times um, the cooperator uh, that you're working with will purchase, you know, will purchase the material because they have the permit or a registrant will provide you with that material. But in general, you don't, you're not generally required to seek a restricted materials permit to include a restricted materials in your research trials. And it's all because we have this policy. But you do have to report pesticide use. So we can talk about, I think we'll get to all of these things. Um, so here we go. Um, so basically, uh, we're exempt from 
obtaining a research authorization because we have this policy that's been approved by DPR. Um, and as long as we follow all policy instructions and the re all of the laws and regulations that fall outside of this policy, um, as long as we're in compliance, then we don't need a research authorization. There are just like a couple of, of exceptions to that. And one is if you, and I don't think the exceptions apply to most people. One is if you're using genetic, genetically modified microbials, microbes as part of your pesticide trials, you have to get a research authorization. And if in some uses of groundwater chemicals, but we'll actually talk about that in more detail. So those are the two areas where you would have to get a research authorization um, and you wouldn't be exempted from that. But otherwise you don't have to go through the DPR process. Um, we have our own process. I, and I don't approve things, you know, the research authorization is requesting approval by DPR to do this research. And I don't like approve or deny, I just consult and I help you comply and do the right thing. So if we're a UC employee, for example, a lot of times at the RECs, we're doing research applications, but we're also doing basic maintenance applications. So if you're a UC employee and you're making applications for pest control purposes, so you're controlling your weeds on the right of way or along the irrigation ditch, or you're managing some pest in the ornamental plantings that are just for um, decoration um, aesthetics, the, that is pesticides for pest control purposes. So if you're using a restricted material and those applications, then you do actually have to get a restricted materials permit. However, if you are conducting a research trial and you happen to be including restricted materials in those research trials, then you're not required to get a, a restricted materials permit for those purposes. Um, so a reminder that experimental pesticide use can be can take many, many forms. So, um, but the intent is that the application is made for research purposes only. Um, no commercial pest control benefit is intended or expected. So we might be working with a cooperator and if they get some economic, you know, benefit from doing this trial from us, if it's um, um, incidental to the research, that's fine. But it isn't the reason for the research, right? Um, and then applications must conform to state and federal guidelines, except when we're exempted from them under this policy. Um, so research using pest control chemicals, let's call them pesticides because that's what they are, can consist of either experimental pesticide application, so number of compounds, or um, applications made strictly in accordance with California labels or both. Um, anything experimental um, has to conform with this policy. So I get, this is just a recognition that sometimes you're you're following all label instructions and you're just comparing efficacy of an available product with something new that you're doing research on. So it's totally fine to mix and match, but it's those experimental applications that sometimes you have additional um, notification and reporting requirements on. And I'll get to those. Okay, so university property, this is a definition in the policy. It means land owned or controlled by the UC and includes only property over which the UC maintains day-to-day -day control. Um, usually it's, you know, a research and extension center or it's a campus field station. There um, is a USDA uh, field station that we have, like um, one of our campuses has a memorandum of agreement under and so it runs Anyway, doing research out there are they're in complete control of their research plots as if they were on campus. And so it's the same. So non UC, UC property just means you're working with a cooperator. So it's just UC property and non UC property. It's important to know the distinction because some of our procedures are different. So um, property that's not UC property is under the day to day control of somebody else. Like you could show up at the field and people are walking through your research plots. I mean, I know that that doesn't happen that, happen that often, but it's more possible than on UC property, okay? So if you're working with parks, then it, the park is non-UC property, obviously. Like a local county state park, 
um, or if you're working with a private landowner, um, putting out some walnut trials. So that's a cooperator, that's non-UC property. So we've got another poll for you about UC property. Okay, so this poll is asking, is there anything you have to do differently when you are making experimental pesticide applications off of university property? So your responses are, you can choose one of these. So no, your procedure will stay the same whether you're on or off university property. Yes, you have to file an appendix one when you are off university property. Or yes, you have to post warning signs when you are off university property. So which one of those do you think is the correct answer to the question, um, is there anything you have to do differently when making experimental pesticide applications off of university property? Okay, wow, everyone responded. Great, that's awesome, thank you. Okay, I'm gonna share the results. All right. Uh, okay, thank you. So, um, the okay, if you, okay, the first question, I'm sorry. The first answer is no, my procedure is the same whether I'm on or off. That is not like 100% true. Um, if you responded, yes, so 49% of you responded, yes, I have to file an appendix one when I'm off university property and that's the difference. And that's true. This is this is the correct answer, the second one. And then the third one, I um, have to post warning signs when I'm off university property. Here's the thing, when you're on university property, oftentimes you do have to post warning signs as well. So everything is the same except the appendix one. Okay, so the appendix one is uh, the first um, page in your handout. I'm gonna go ahead and switch to my handouts just to show you what I'm talking about. And Sarah put a link in the chat up above um, to the policy and procedure manual and that you can find the appendix one there as well. But let me just go ahead and share my handouts really fast. I also just posted a link to the appendix one in the chat. Okay, thank you. Cause I yes, now like the online version is a fillable form. Mm -hmm. So here, let's, let's go over the appendix one. So appendix one is required for experimental pesticide applications that are conducted off university property. Okay, so this is the primary difference. All the other procedures should be essentially the same. And so this is specifically for experimental. So something that's you don't have a label for or you're using it in conflict with the label. Okay, and this has to be off university property. Okay, so here is, here is a key statement. At least 24 hours before your first experimental application is conducted, the first drop, 24 hours before the first drop of pesticide that you don't have a label to support your use, you have to submit this form. You have to fill file this form. So tell me, where, who are you giving this form to? I tell you to file the form. That means give it to somebody, right? Who, there are three people who get a copy of this filled out form. Tell me who, the, who they are. And you can tell me in the chat because I know you can't actually unmute. Who are you giving this form, giving a copy of this form to? The grower, that's what George says. That's that's one, that's correct. Ag commissioner, that's two, that's correct. Okay, ah, and then Stephanie says, keep one for yourself. So there's three copies, okay? If the printer in your office works, then awesome. But if you're like me, I, I don't know, just I, my printer doesn't work here. Um, I don't know what to do, but it's, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get over it. So. Okay, you need three forms. And so really the person who needs it that 24 hours before the first drop of experimental pesticide is your ag commissioner. And obviously you're just gonna keep a copy for yourself, but you need to also give a copy to the cooperator because whoever it is you're working with, because they they just might need this if they're inspected. They, they need to have this form. And so if they keep their uh, records electronically, then it's okay to send them this record electronically that's fine. 
And if your ag commissioner accepts them electronically, I don't know if they do. I think that the answer depends. Is you ask all 58 counties, you're going to get 58 different answers. So you know, follow their instructions how they want to receive this. So this this serves as our notice of intent. So usually, if somebody gets a a regular person, you know, not us, not UC people, just a regular pesticide applicator in the state of California, has to get a restricted materials permit, and then you know, 24 hours ahead of their restricted materials application, or maybe it's 48, I don't know, we have to notify the ag commissioner. This is our notice of intent, whether it's restricted materials or not. They just want to know that we're, they just want to be prepared that we're doing this stuff. So 24 hours is the minimum, but let me just encourage you that if you have more time, if you can notify them uh, more with more advance notice, please do that, okay? Because they just, they like to know what's going on, not just so they can come out and inspect you, but just because they get questions from people and they need to know what's going on so that they can answer the questions. Okay, so uh, it's the same form for every county. It's a university form, okay? So here, we're gonna put the county, you know, county of the application. Sometimes you guys are working in multiple counties and that's totally cool. So then you're gonna put the name, address, phone number of the research supervisor. That's that's somebody at the UC. Um, sometimes it's the PI, sometimes it's, you know, the SRA that's really uh, responsible for carrying out all the operations. Whoever puts their name here, whatever name goes here, that's the person that's responsible. That's the person that's going to get called if something bad happens. So you know, you might want to have some discussions with um, your staff or your supervisor to discuss, you know, like whose name goes there. And then the grower's name. This says grower, but it really should say cooperator. And in fact, I'm going to see if I can change that on the form. I'm going to make a note. I don't know why I just thought of that. Okay, thank you. And so their contact information. So somebody, whoever puts their name here has to have a QAL or a QAC, and then you have to put that number here, okay? And let me just be clear, when we're making pesticide applications that you see, like experimental applications, we have to have a QAC or a QAL. You can't do experimental pesticide applications without a license or certificate. Let me just be clear. So somebody has to have that uh, qualification. And then not everybody on staff who's involved in the application has to have this, but somebody does. And that person is responsible. Okay. Um, and then, um, so here it says, you need to tell them the pesticides that are going to be applied, including product name, um, experimental number, or whatever information you have. And you can just attach that, you know, like your trial list or something like that. Location of the trial and site ID number. So you're working with a cooperator, they like, they should have a site ID number um, with the county. And so put that down there so that the ag commissioner can connect it with the piece of land um, where you're making that pesticide application, size of the trial, commodity to be treated. So if you're not treating a commodity, then just put whatever you're treating. So it's really the site to be treated. So if that happens to be a walnut orchard, say that. If it's a rice, if it's a rice pad, a rice field, say that. Um, or if it's um, ornamental plantings, say that. Okay. So your anticipated dates of first and last applications. Um, and then here, this is what's really important. You need to tell the ag commissioner, like I'm doing an experimental pesticide application. Sometimes that means we have to do crop destruct. And we're gonna talk about those rules in more detail. But sometimes we have to do crop destruct and sometimes we don't, okay? So you need to tell them what your intent is. Like I've determined the crop can enter the channels of trade. I'm not crop destructing. Um, destroy the, I'm gonna destroy the crop because you know I put out pesticides that aren't registered. Or if you have like a non-crop or a non-bearing crop, like a first year vineyard, a first year orchard, that it's just not bearing, there's, there's no crop destruct to do, right? Okay, so you just got to tell them what's going on with the with the harvest situation. And then tell them the anticipated date of the harvest or the destruction, um, and then signature and then some phone number. Okay, so any questions on this appendix one? Yeah, Lisa, we have a few questions in the Q&A. Um, so I'll just go down the list. So the first question is from John, and they're asking, um, 
In urban locations such as a residential property, what is the site identification number? Um, you would have to ask your cooperator. So they, like if they report pesticide use regularly, then they would have a site ID number because um, it's connected. I mean, I can double check that. <laughs> maybe, maybe Sarah knows. <laughs> She's helped me do some research into pesticide use reports. But I believe it's not just the ag applications that have a site ID, but it might also be like the landscape applications. But um, either Sarah or I will check on that. I, I do believe that they would have a site ID. And if they don't, it's whatever they use to report their regular pesticide use because they're still reporting pesticide use. So like if you put out a trial on cooperators property, they have to report that pesticide use or you tell them what you applied and then they put it in their report. So the ad commissioner is just trying to connect your appendix one to their pesticide use report. Okay. So whatever it is that they use to identify, it could be a site ID, it could be something else, but we'll, we'll, um, we'll dig that up for you. Okay. Uh, so the next question is, do we need an appendix one if we're doing a collaborative experimental pesticide trial that is sprayed by the grower? Yes, that's a good question. That's a good nuance. So if you are, so if it's experimental and that grower is not applying for a research authorization, then that means you have to file this form, okay? So we, if we're working under our policy instead of the research authorization process, then yes, we have to fill out this form. So you're responsible in some way. And hopefully the grower also has their QAL or QAC. That's my assumption, okay? Um, but yeah, that's a great question. Okay. Um, and then we have a question about organic pesticides. So is DPR or CCOF, I don't know what that stands for, but is DPR or CCOF the agent to approve the registration? For um, it's always EPA and then DPR, you know, EPA first and then DPR. So CCOF is the certified, California certified organic farms, right? And so that's a third party organic certification body. They do not approve, they may approve or disapprove of pesticides for organic use, but they don't approve or disapprove of the registration. So many organic pesticides are registered either by EPA or by EPA and DPR. So if you have, um, if you are you applying a pesticide that has an EPA registration number, um, then you do have to fill out this form. You have to, um, you know, and you're using it in an experimental way. Um, you would have to, you know, fill out this form. You'd have to report the pesticide use. It's, it's, a, it's a pesticide. If it's organic or not, it's still a pesticide if you're trying to kill a pest. So it is, um, I, there's a slide in this deck. It might be one of the optional slides. I can't remember at the moment but I talk about a little bit about organic research trials. And so maybe can we hold that to the end and I'll just make sure um, I talk about it. Okay. Or, I mean, if you wanna make sure that I address your questions, then you can just give me more questions, even though I'm just gonna answer them later. That would be great. Okay, so, oh, we have, well, okay. There's a few that popped in. I'm trying to see if they are relevant. Yeah. So if we are doing a pesticide trial with products that are not experimental and following the label, we do not need to file an appendix A. I'm assuming they mean appendix one. Just They just need to have the cooperator report use. Is that correct? Yeah, that's a great question. If you're doing research, but you've got a label to support your use, you're following the label instructions and you're doing that on cooperators property, it's not in an experimental application. It's research, but it's not an experimental application. So you would not need um, to fill out the appendix one. Um, and, but yes, your cooperator would need to report the pesticide use. Okay. Um, and then for filling out the appendix one, someone had a question about, so if they're specifically using a pre-emergent pesticide, the commodity to be treated, would they say it's soil or what would they consider the commodity in that situation? 
Um, so the question about commodity, like on this form, is totally related to whether or not it's connected to the concept of whether or not you have to do crop destruct. So I would put the ac actual commodity, but I would specify, you know, pre-emergent on strawberry. So if you're doing a soil fumigant application, for example, or maybe you're doing um, a pre-emergent herbicide application and nothing's been planted yet, but something will be planted. Because the idea is that, you know, there will still be resin, likely will still be residues in the soil when you do go in and plant. So yeah, what it's whatever that commodity is, is grow is going to be growing there after your pre-emergent application. But you can specify pre-emergent to strawberries or whatever it is. Okay, so then a quick follow-up question regarding that site identification number, um, and maybe we'll just address this later, but they're asking if the homeowner would know the site ID number if they're not applying the pesticides. So a homeowner would not have a site ID if you're if talking truly about like at somebody's home, um, there wouldn't be a, I, I know for sure there wouldn't be a site ID. Um, so if you're, I don't know if you're talking about, you know, just like landscape applications in somebody's home, home garden or whatever, you know, yard, or if you're talking about structural application, so I there would not be a site ID number. So again, it's like whatever a profession, you know, if a, for example, if you're talking about structural applications, um, I can't see who asked the question, so I don't know. Oh. Um, but if you're like whatever, like if a professional structural pest control board certified applicator were making that same application, how would they identify the property? It wouldn't be through a site ID. So you would just use whatever identifying information that a professional would have to use in their pesticide use report. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think we're, we're done with questions. So okay. continue on. <laughs> All right. So let me go back to my PowerPoint. Okay. Yeah, we talked about all that. So if we don't comply with this policy, we'll lose our policy and then we'll have to get research authorizations, which means every time you want to put out an experimental trial, you have to ask permission from the Department of Pesticide Regulation. So how about let's not do that? <laughs> I don't think that would be good for business. I don't think that would be um, good for your research programs. And so that's why compliance is really important. Um, so just uh, this is just a note and I don't want to belabor it, but um, DPR changed the research authorization process. And so how I just said that the appendix one has to be filed at least 24 hours ahead of the application. Um, outside people, those without a policy and that are getting research authorizations, they have to give 72 hours notice to their ag commissioner, um, you know, do their notice of intent or whatever. So um, DPR is asking for you to give ag commissioners more time, but it's not required for us, okay? But if you have more, if you're able to give them more notice, then please do that. Okay, so let's talk about, remember at the bottom of that appendix one, I was sort of addressing the issue of uh, tolerances and crop destruct. So let's talk about tolerance. What on earth do I mean by tolerances? So we have a poll for you. Okay, so this poll is asking, a tolerance is the maximum amount of pesticide residue that can be on a commodity um, at the time of the last application, uh, when it leaves the country, or at harvest. So what is a tolerance? All right, so I'm going to end the poll and share the results. All right. Okay. Thank you. So 89% um, of you said that a tolerance is the maximum amount of pesticide residue that can be on a commodity at harvest. And that's absolutely correct. Um, so here we go. It's the maximum pesticide residue level. Um, and it, it has to be measured in a laboratory setting. So you can't just go out there like with a microscope and be like, oh, I'm at five parts per billion. I'm cool. Like you don't know. It has to be sent out for, uh, you know, like lab analysis. Um, but let's talk about that. So tolerances are established at the federal level. They're in the California, I'm the code of the 40 CFR code of federal regulations. They're in part 180. Um, I think I might be able to have the link for you. Um, and perhaps the last page of the handouts, 
is a list of all the links. I believe I included that. Um, I'm sorry, March is like the by far the busiest month of my whole life. And March is not over yet. You just don't even know. So I can't remember every single thing that I've done this month. I cannot possibly do it. So, um, so here we go. So what do I want to say about a tolerance? Um, so tell me, most people, I believe on this call have not had to look up a tolerance. Um, so tell me, and that's totally cool. That's, that's what I would expect. Why on earth would anybody ever look up a tolerance? Tell me why, like when, when, in what situation would you find yourself, um, needing to look up a tolerance for in connection with, with one of your experimental pesticide trials? So you can tell me in the chat. Okay, so I see some responses that say, if you've sprayed at a higher rate, you don't know if you've exceeded the tolerance. So the tolerances that are here in the 40 CFR um, are based on what the EPA registered label tells you. Essentially, if you're following EPA label instructions, EPA registered label instructions, you are not going to exceed the tolerance. But if you're spraying at a higher rate, that's use in conflict, and you might exceed the tolerance. Okay, you don't know. Um, if you are making more frequent applications, that's use in conflict, and it might result in too high of residues uh, of tolerance. You know, exceeding the tolerance. Um, and so, if you want to do all these things, you can. But if that commodity I'm talking commodities that are going to be eaten by humans or animals or consumed, you know, because drinking too, we drink things too. So if it's, this commodity is ever going to be consumed by humans or animals, um, then the pesticides cannot, at harvest, cannot exceed the tolerance. So you may have to do crop destruct if you exceed the tolerance or if you have no idea if you've exceeded it. So if you're following label instructions, you're not exceeding the tolerance. Totally not. Um, tolerances are established federally, not at the state. So if you've got an EPA registered label, you are not exceeding the tolerance as long as you're following the instructions. So sometimes uh, researchers are doing research with very high value crops and the cooperator is not interested in doing crop destruct, okay? So at that point, you need to figure out what the tolerance is for your pesticide, and then you need to do <clears throat> a residue analysis at the time of harvest. So meaning, I mean, I can go into more detail about this. I don't want to belabor all of the steps because it doesn't apply to everybody. But if you're in that situation, then let's chat later. But basically, you need to take a representative sample of what will be harvested and send it out to a lab for residue analysis. <clears throat> and if you've exceeded the tolerance, you have to do crop destruct or you got to wait to harvest. Okay. But if you haven't exceeded the tolerance, even if you used the pesticide in conflict with the label, then it's fine. But you have to have proof that you didn't exceed the tolerance. Okay. So you could potentially exceed a tolerance if you are using a pesticide not in accordance with the label. So uh, is there a question, Katrina? Yeah, there is a question. It kind of goes back to the previous slide, though. It's about uh, whether a cooperator um, needs to report the use for research authorization and experimental trial if they're the one purchasing the pesticide. If they have to report the pesticide use, I guess. Well, all <clears throat> experimental research trials, um, all pesticide applications, um, to production ag or research or production of an ag, the research or production of an ag commodity um, have to be reported. So it doesn't matter if it's experimental or not, you are supposed to report. So the cooperator can report or you can report on behalf of the cooperator. It's probably um, easier for the cooperator to report along with their other, you know, pesticides that they've used that month. 
Right. And there wouldn't be any violation, right? Because the research use authorization has gone through the ad commissioners. So they would be they would be aware that the cooperator is using so you have to non so this is sort of jumping ahead to a future mm -hmm. session, but basically um, you would want to report to experimental commodity. So whatever the code is for experimental commodity, that's how you report. So don't report peaches if you are applying to peaches, but you're way exceeding the rate. Don't do that because that like raises red flags. It would be um, reporting to experimental commodity and then you report what pesticide you used and at what rate. Okay, and then there's one more question, but I think you're about to get to it. If there's no tolerance, then it is a crop destruct, right? Yeah, that's a great question. So if you have exceeded the tolerance, you think you've exceeded the tolerance, or there is no tolerance, you have to crop destruct. That whatever cannot enter the channels of trade. You cannot feed it to a pig. You cannot feed it to a cow. You cannot give it away. You, it cannot be consumed. And it has to be destroyed. Um, so one thing I did want to say about tolerances is, is that they're established by active ingredient. You're not going to look up a registration number here or a product name. It's by active ingredient. So I have here, um, I know that you can't see it well, but this is um, the tolerances for azoxystrobin. And then it's by tolerance, it's by active ingredient, and then it's each commodity. But I just want to point out something that like, so the different uses end uses of the commodity could have a different tolerance for the same active ingredient. So here it's like corn field forage has 12 parts per million. Okay, that's the tolerance. Don't You don't need to remember that. Just for a second, remember it. But corn field and grain has a 0 0.05 part per million tolerance. Okay, so the end use of that commodity determines the tolerance. It's not all citrus. It's if you're selling the fresh citrus or you, you are um, juicing the citrus, that's a different tolerance. So you need to make sure that the specific end use of your commodity is on the tolerance list. And there are some pesticides that have an exemption from tolerance. They're mostly things like um, those things that are listed as, they're lower toxicity products. They're like clove oil and things like that. Okay, so Commodities treated with any experimental pesticide for which there's no pesticide, no residue tolerance, and there's no exemption from a tolerance, they cannot enter the channels of trade or in any way be made for use as a human or animal food or feed or drink. Okay. Um, and <clears throat> you, as a research supervisor, has primary responsibility to ensure that the treated commodity is posted as experimental and also destroyed. So I, I want to address a comment that Luis made. So no, I think I already addressed it. So if you're not really sure if you've exceeded the tolerance because you're going against some label statements and it's a high value crop, you can send it out for residue analysis. <clears throat> and then, you know, as long you got to keep the proof that you have not exceeded the tolerance and then it can enter the channels of trade, even though you've used that pesticide in conflict with the label. Now, like your cooperator couldn't do this unless you were involved in the research trial. They can't just do this for their commercial, uh, the commercial side of their operation. This is specifically because it's related to a research project. So destroyed means rendered unfit for utilization as human or animal feed. So one example is, you know, burning the hay. Um, but some people till it under or disc it under or you just smash it and you and like the IR4 program has their own special procedure. So it can't, again, it can't be used as animal feed um, just because you can't sell it or something like that. So when you're, when you have a, if you have a plot, my assumption is that, you know, like um, you've got like a 12 plots in your trial and maybe, you know, 10 or five of them have an experimental pesticide because you're doing all different types of pesticide applications, right? So it's just, you know, those plots technically that have to be destroyed. Like it's the ones that you don't have a tolerance for. Um, but so the remaining plant parts, so like if you've got a tree or something that just like is never going to go away, like it's a permanent, it's a perennial, right? 
Um, then there is this crop destruct tape. So, and then you can put that just on the trees where you're doing an experimental pesticide application. But you could also do it like, you know, uh, put orange fencing in a sign around, you know, that area of the research plot that where you're doing these experimental applications that will be destroyed. So it's just, you have to be very clear because we're, whether we're working with cooperators or we're working on UC property, you have to make it very clear which plots have to be destroyed because you don't want anybody coming out and like, oh, that strawberry looks good. I'm going to take it. No, they shouldn't be doing that anyways. But that's especially egregious if you're in an experimental situation where you don't have a tolerance for that because you have no idea um, what the health imp implications are of that. Uh, did you have a question? Yeah. Luis had a follow up question in on that note he's uh, he's asking do only federally registered products have a tolerance. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question so as tolerances are established at the federal level so they're not established DPR does not have the authority to establish a tolerance and that's why it's really hard to know what pesticides can be used, for example, on cannabis or on hemp. So cannabis is federally illegal. I don't know why I'm mentioning cannabis is going to open a can of worms, but no tolerances are going to be established on cannabis federally for a while. So that's why it's hard to use pesticides on cannabis. And then hemp, hopefully um, the FDA has some determinations to make. Um, because EPA and FDA work together on these tolerances. Anyway, so with hemp, it's actually, you know, it's not an illegal commodity anymore. And so presumably tolerances will be established so that, you know, um, you know, more pesticides can be used on hemp. But yes, that's, that's the reason why hemp and cannabis are so complicated because um, DPR doesn't have the authority to um, establish a tolerance and they would never register something that's not already registered by EPA. They just simply don't have the authority to do that, except for an ad, something like an adjuvant, which is not required to be registered by EPA. So um, where was I going with that? What was the question? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Did I, did if, I address if, the question? I already forgot. I think you did. I mean, there's also, I think um, there's also the point that all pesticides need to be federally registered, right? Is that there's, there's no, there are no pesticides that are only California registered, correct? Yeah, except for the ones that aren't required to be registered by EPA. Yeah. Like adjuvants. Mm -hmm. Okay. Exactly. Um, so uh, it's important to post these. So there is this field posting sign that's really specific to this. Okay, you don't have to use the sign, this, but these are the words that have to be on the sign. You can make your own sign, but it has to be, you know, like legible, readable from like 25 feet. Readable by whose eyes, I don't know. Like the regulation doesn't actually specify that, but somebody with like normal or corrected vision should be able to read the sign from 25 feet away. Um, and it has to be in a second language if that's applicable to the employees that could be potentially entering that area. So commodity treated with experimental pesticide, do not harvest. Okay. Um, so again, so the crop destruct intention is written into that appendix one document. Um, so you have to say, I'm going to crop destruct, or I don't need to crop destruct, or I have a non-bearing or non-edible commodity and no crop destruct. Like if you're doing um, applications on ornamentals and no animals or humans are intended to eat the pro, you know, what comes off of those plants, you absolutely do not have to destroy that crop or that commodity. Um, so some CAC uh, uh, county ag commissioners would like, you know, 24 hour notice of crop destruction. Remember on that appendix one, there is like a, a place where you can indicate when you think that you will be doing crop destruct. But, you know, none of us can actually predict the future. I try all the time and I'm terrible at it. So I think the same is true for everybody else in this virtual room. We can't really predict the future. So sometimes that changes. So if if it changes significantly, then please communicate with your county ag commissioner. Sometimes they like to be there or they like to do compliance assistance or, or they just want to they just want to know what's going on. Um, because they're sort of responsible if something goes wrong as well. So, you know, they just need to know. 
And um, so just check with them when you're submitting your, you know, appendix one, like, do you want to be there? Do you want, what do you want me to do? Like, you know, what do you want me to do beside tell you when I think I'm going to destroy this crop? Um, so I often get um, calls either from researchers or from a county ag commissioner staff. Sometimes there's turnover in the staff. So you might be working with a new person or you might be new to this type of research and they're like, what the heck is going on? You can't do this research. You don't have an RA research authorization or you can't do this because it's against the label. This is an enforcement letter. It's a link to, you know, a copy of the enforcement letter. Enforcement letter is a letter written by DPR headquarters to communicate some issue to the counties, to the county ag commissioners. And this very specifically communicates, UC has a research, um, pesticide research policy. They are allowed to do experimental applications if they result in an exceedance of a tolerance that's permitted by law then they can do crop destruct and that's what they'll do. So it is a communication tool. So sometimes you have to provide that to your um, ag commissioner staff if they're just unfamiliar with this particular process. They have big jobs, they have to you know, know a lot of things. So sometimes this is, this is a thing that they may not know. So what happens if you, you are making experimental applications with a cooperator and you go out there and everything that you were supposed to crop destruct has been harvested. It's gone. Like that's a problem, right? Okay, we can just recognize that that's a problem. So you need to, um, don't just like run away and like go off the grid. You need to start getting, you need to get on the phone and start notifying people immediately. You need to, the most important thing here is that they be able to trace where that harvested commodity went and remove it from the channels of trade because it is not safe. It is not necessarily safe for human consumption. We simply don't know because the studies haven't been done and that's why there's no tolerance established. Or we do know and nobody would ever establish a tolerance because the human health effects are bad. So um, notify the CAC, notify your cooperator, Notify uh, somebody at DPR, I would assume, you know, enforcement people, but also I think the ag commissioner would elevate it to their DPR enforcement person. You see a and &R, that's not me. Um, I would say that that's probably Brian Oatman. He might tell you it's me, but I'm going to tell you it's Brian Oatman because um, I really have no authority to do anything. I just tell you guys what to do, but I can't make you do it. So um, maybe Brian can, I'm not sure. And then if you're on a campus, then notify your department chair. And if you're in a county, then notify your county director. So, I mean, you can keep me in the loop, but I don't know. Like <laughs> what's most important is that we've removed the har that harvested commodity from the channels of trade and that it gets destroyed. So I haven't been here for 17 years, but I've been doing this job for probably this part of my job for like eight or nine years. And this, this list precedes me. So for the last 17 years, no known violations. I mean, I don't want to hear about it if it's in the past and I can't do anything about it. So I don't want to know. Um, but, and, you know, let's just, let's just keep it at this. I would love nothing more than to next year change this number from 17 to 18. So, um, so food or feed traded, treated with pesticides that are registered for application on the test site and applied at or below the registered label rates can be harvested and allowed to enter the, the channels of trade as long as you've followed all label and state regulatory conditions, okay? So basically, if you've got a registered pesticide and you're following the label instructions, you're fine. You're not going to exceed the tolerance. I do have one poll for you. Uh, we're going to, I forgot to say, we're going to take a break in just a few minutes. I want to get through this section and then we're going to take a five minute break. Um, but so we're going to launch this poll. Okay. So this question is asking, you are using a pesticide that is registered by the US EPA, but is not registered in California. You're following all label instructions. Do you need to be concerned about exceeding the tolerance? Yes or no? And um, I can't, I couldn't remember who in the chat, or there's a lot of Johns in the poll or on the webinar today. So 
But John, who was asking about site ID numbers, I responded to your question um, in the Q&A, but I don't know if it notified you. So <laughs> just thought I'd put that little plug in right here. <laughs> what is the answer, Sarah? Um, well, I did, I asked for a little more clarification. Oh, okay. I'm okay. Totally sure. But basically if you're doing non-production ag pest control, a site ID number is not required. It's okay. only for production ag. Um, but even though a site ID number is not required, you do need like the business or the individual applying that pesticide needs an operator ID number, which is the number you put on your pesticide use report. And that's probably the number you would be putting on any other um, paperwork or authorizations that are connected to you and your research or your pesticide use. Um, okay. so I'm wondering if I could um, update that appendix one form, not just to say cooperator instead of grower, but instead of site ID, I can add some information like operator ID if it's not a production ad or something, just give better instructions on that. So, okay. Yeah, it, it was a good question because it is kind of confusing, so. Yep. All right, I'm gonna let you answer this question. Thank Lisa. you. <laughs> and also just as a note, I mean, honestly, um, this policy and the appendix one was written with ag in mind. And so when I went through and I updated the policy, I really tried to make it broad because I know we have a lot more um, pesticide researchers <clears throat> outside of and not involved in production ag. So um, anywhere where you feel like it's not clear for ag versus non-ag, I really would like for you to tell me, even if it's just in an email, you don't have to say it on the webinar, because um, I would like to make it more clear for people. So thank you. I really appreciate that question. Okay, so if you're using a pesticide that is registered by US EPA and it's not registered in California, we're following all label instructions. So that's an experimental application. In California, it's experimental. In Nevada, not experimental. In California, it is. Okay. But do you have to worry about exceeding the tolerance if you're following all the label instructions? If we are just split right down the middle. Um, but there, the no's in shout ahead of the yeses, which means that the no's have it. So it's correct. So basically, because tolerances are federally established, if it's not registered in California, it's just the EPA label that you need to follow in order to avoid exceeding a tolerance. So if something is registered by EPA, but not in California, it's experimental, right? But you can still harvest it and it can enter the channels of trade you're not going to exceed a federal tolerance if you're following the federal label instructions. So any questions on that? Sometimes that throws people for a loop. Okay. Basically, if you're following the federal label, you're cool. Or if you're following the label, you're cool. Okay. So pesticides that are applied above label rates, that, um, what am I saying? Experimental applications may include those that are above the label rate. Um, and so if you're doing that, or if you're shortening the PHI, or if you are shortening the retreatment interval from what the label says, um, then, then you have to worry about the tolerance. So if you are using this in conflict with any label registered by EPA and or California, um, then you do need to worry about the tolerance. And then you could either crop destruct or do a lab analysis um, to ensure that you haven't exceeded the tolerance. Um, or you can search in the tolerance exemptions. You might be exempt from a tolerance. Not likely if it's a conventional pesticide, just gonna say it. Um, so when you file the pesticide use report, when either you or your cooperator file the pesticide use report, you report it to research commodity. You don't report it to tomatoes or walnuts if you've exceeded a label rate because that raises red flags in the pesticide use reporting system. So this is easy. It's just a, a, a better way to do it. What the reason behind the pesticide use reporting requirements is really to see how much pesticide we're putting out in the state of California. Okay. It's not tied to the, it's just, they just want to know what pesticides are being applied. Okay, that's what they want to know. So you research commodity instead of what you actually applied it to. Um, so I hear often 
enough that um, people say that they are reporting their pesticide use, but the ag commissioner is like, no, I don't want to, I don't want your pesticide use report. Please do not report that you applied 0 0.005 ounces of this pesticide to a research commodity in my county. I don't want to know that. Like they don't want you to add it to their pesticide use report. And that's fine. I mean, I would communicate with your ag commissioner, but the thing is, the policy and the state rules do say that you're supposed to report pesticide use. Your cooperator is supposed to report pesticide use. I'm not going to sit here and say, don't report pesticide use. But I am going to tell you to communicate with your ag commissioner and to uh, maintain a very good relationship with them because you have to work with them. Um, so whatever, I would just, you know, you need to talk to them and communicate with them about, you know, your whole research trial, but really in particular the pesticide use report and sort of what their, um, what their preference is, um, but maybe explain to them that I'm going to report to research commodity. Is that okay? And so obviously it's much more important if you're doing large scale research trials or a lot with the same pesticide. Okay. I, I think there's like just a couple more slides in this section, then we'll take a five minute break. So maximum residue levels are basically the international equivalent of a tolerance. It's the amount of residue that's allowed on the harvested commodity. So like Japan uh, may have a different tolerance level than the United States does, which might be different than the European Union countries. Okay, so just keep that in mind. Um, I don't think, I don't know if I have another poll here. So U.S. tolerances and MRLs may not be exactly the same, okay? So you, when you, um, yes, let's go to this poll. <laughs> Trying to remember. Okay, so this one is asking, um, wow, <laughs> okay, my brain wasn't going to my mouth. There we go. When do you need to worry about whether or not you have exceeded the MRL, the maximum residue level. Ah, shouldn't have tried to, <laughs> that's correct, right? That's Lisa? maximum residue level. I'm sorry, I should never put an acronym in the question. This no, time. that's okay. I um, I started saying it and then I started second guessing myself. Okay, so when do you need to worry about whether or not you have exceeded the maximum residue level? When you are working with an export commodity, when you are preparing for an expect inspection or you don't need to worry about the maximum residue level. Which of those is the correct answer? All right, pretty much everyone's responded. Oh, perfect, everyone responded, Nick time. Okay, so 93% um, of you know that um, MRLs are important when you are working with an export commodity. Okay, so they are just, they may be more strict than our, than our US established tolerances, which is to say you could be following all label instructions um, and you won't exceed the tolerance, but you still might not be able to export it to some other country. So um, if you are working with a commodity with a cooperator who exports their, you know, product, then you need to be very aware of what the MRLs are, or maybe, you know what, the thing is your cooperator is going to be aware. They're going to know what pesticides would cause them a problem um, with exporting, but it's really good to communicate that. So, um, so the global MRL database is now part of Bryant Christie, whatever that is, but they maintain this database. And so um, so I just, I think I did this for Clopyrifa. So you can look up um, the commodity, the active ingredient, and then the markets. I hope that you can see this, but I've got nuts, nut, comma, almonds. The pesticide is chlorpyrifos, it's active ingredient, so it's not by product or registration number. And I've checked off the markets for the EU, Japan, Codex, which is an international standard that some countries accept and some don't. So it, it might be, you know, like completely irrelevant. And then Korea. Okay. So I go here and it's here. So chlorpyrifos applied to almonds, the federal tolerance is 0.2. Um, is that parts? I, I'm gonna assume parts per million, but I must've cut off the screenshot. So it's 0.2 parts per million, but the codex EU and Korea 
have an import tolerance of 0 0.05 parts per billion. So they don't accept as much chlorpyrifos residue on their commodities. Um, Japan is equivalent to the United States. Okay, so you would need to know at harvest if you've exceeded, you know, the MRL in, in addition to, you know, the tolerance. Um, but this is only in certain circumstances. Um, okay, so this is a good time for us to take a five minute break. I think by the time I stop talking, it'll be 1042. So let's come back at 1047. And um, if you have any questions, just keep putting them in the chat and the, I mean, in the Q&A. Um, and so let's, yeah, let's come back at 1047. Okay. I trust everybody's back. Or if you're not back, you'll probably hear my voice and then you'll come back. Um, so I want to talk about groundwater protection, but as it relates to the policy, so earlier we talked about the research authorization and how for following our policy, most um, experimental pesticide uses do not require a research authorization from DPR. Special permission from DPR to do some research. We don't have to request it. There's two situations in which we do. One, if we're applying groundwater chemical, groundwater polluting chemicals in a groundwater protection area, we do have to get a research authorization. Or two, if we're doing genetically modified microbial pesticide applications. So if you're genetically modifying microbes, then you have to get a research authorization. I'm not actually going to talk about that because I've never talked to anybody in all my years that is doing that. But I do want to talk about groundwater protection and how to know um, what are the groundwater polluting chemicals and how to know um, if you're in a groundwater protection area. Okay. So I just said all of this. Okay. So there is a list of herbicides. They're uh, soil applied herbicides. They're in the three, uh, the California Code of Regulations, section 6800. There's two lists of pesticides in that section. The A list is those um, that are known to found in, be found in groundwater. Like we're going to be finding at if nobody applies a single drop of atrazine from now until the end of time, we will still be finding atrazine in our groundwater. It's just there. It's going to be there forever because it leaches and, and that's all there is to it. Even if you, um, yeah, anyways, it's just um, easier to leach. It's very uh, persistent and somewhat soluble. Anyway, so these are pesticides that we know are going to make it to groundwater. So we restrict them in groundwater sensitive areas. Okay. There's also a B list and they're not restricted, but they're active ingredients that we think are probably going to end up in ground or surface water if we're not careful. And so um, DPR reserves the right to monitor for the hundred and something active ingredients that are in the B list. But that's all I'm going to say about the B list. Let's focus on the A list. Okay. Cause these are the real, these are like the real deal here. So if you are applying any of these active ingredients, in a research trial, in a groundwater protection area, you are not exempt from a research authorization or a restricted materials permit. So you no longer get those exemptions. I don't believe anybody is doing this, but this is good information, even if you're not including these active ingredients in your research trials, um, because it could be really good information for local growers or what have you. So these are pesticides that because of their chemistry and the because of the way that they're applied, their soil applied they're di directly to the soil. Um, they're probably somewhat soluble and they're persistent, meaning they last in the environment for a long time. So unless you do a superb job of water management and um, a management of your application, they're likely going to end up in groundwater. They just are. So um, certain counties have groundwater protection areas, and this is a California law or a California regulation. Um, this is an EPA thing. And so based on the environmental factors of that area of land, um, DPR has determined if that, you know, square of land is 
um, prone to contamination or not. And if it is, then it's a groundwater protection area. It's just a combination of looking at depth to groundwater and um, the soil characteristics. Okay, so if you go to this website, I just go to Google California groundwater protection areas. It just takes me right where I wanna go. And um, I click on, I, one of these two, I can't remember. This one, oh, this one's a different color. So I think this is where I went, groundwater protection area lists. And then you get a list of counties that have a groundwater protection area in them. And then you click on your county. And in this case, I clicked on Riverside County. So this, the grayed out sections are not Riverside County. The white background is Riverside County. Okay. And so um, anything that, okay, these maps, I have to step back just a second. These maps look just a tiny bit different. Um, they're harder to read. So they've made that improvement to make them harder to read because um, we love that. But so I kept the old map because it's just easier for me to see the color coding on this map. But anyways, you'll notice that there's some areas of this county are not white, right? They're yellow, blue, or orange, but they're squares. You know, anybody want to guess why these are squares? Um, so I'll just tell you. If you want to guess, put it in the chat. But they're squares because, you know, it's um, township range and sections. So these squares are like the one mile sections, okay? So anyways, somewhere, if, if your section is coded a color, for example, if it's yellow, that means you're in an area that is prone to leaching. If you're blue, <gasps> means you're in an area that is prone to runoff. And if you're in orange, you're in an area that is prone to runoff or leaching, okay? I don't, I don't know why the third color isn't the combination of the first two colors. I mean, if you ask me, that's how I would do it. But anyways, I'll stick with it for colors. So if you go to this groundwater protection area um, site on DPR and you look at this map and you're like, oh, I'm in this square and it is yellow. Not everywhere in that square is actually a groundwater sensitive area. It really just depends, you know, on the soil and then the depth to groundwater. So you, if you find yourself, for example, in this area right here, then you would need to go to your county ag commissioner's office and request a more detailed map. So if your research plot is in one of these squares, you have to um, ask for a more detailed map. And if your research plot happens to be in that actual groundwater protection area, then you cannot apply any of these pesticides without a research authorization and a restricted materials permit, okay? Because these are known to reach groundwater and these are landforms where groundwater is very sensitive to contamination, okay? Well, obviously in surface water as well. So any questions on the groundwater protection part of our policy? I'm gonna skip ahead a couple slides because I said this already. Okay, so if there are no questions on groundwater protection and how to know if you're in a groundwater protection area, um, I want to move on to supervisor responsibilities and we have some definitions in the policy. So um, a supervisor, according to this policy is not always like the person who signs the timesheet, okay? It's an employee of the UC working as a researcher, project leader, principal investigator, or just a designated person responsible for this research project. If you are supervising this research project, you are the supervisor for all intents and purposes of, of the people working on that research project. So sometimes um, they are your direct report and sometimes they're not, right? And sometimes, I know we have county employees who are working for many people, okay? So um, you may be their supervisor on your research projects, but then they may um, have a different supervisor on different research projects that they do work on, okay? And so basically the reason we are defining supervisor is because somebody who's in charge of this research project, the supervisor, is likely the person with the QAL or QAC, could, could be different, um, could be multiple, 
on that project. But also you're you're just responsible for making sure the employee is protected in the way that they are supposed to be protected. Okay. Um, I know that our supervisors are also employees, so but you're kind of in charge. So you get to determine if you give yourself the protections that you deserve or not, right? So um, a supervisor is responsible for providing a safe work environment and providing training to people that are working on this project under their direction. I'm not saying you have to be the one to give them training. You have to provide access to training for them during work hours. Um, you need to ensure uh, by training your staff and by supervising this application that pesticides are used in accordance with state, federal laws, regulations, label requirements. So you are responsible, okay? Um, you can delegate some of your authority, but you are the one who needs to be able to check off that list. Yep, I did this. Yes, I did this. Yes, this is being done, okay? So supervisors are, in, are required to make sure employees are aware of the hazards of the chemicals and pesticides being used for experimentation, okay? Um, and you can use the pesticide label as a guide to employee training required. Um, but if you don't have a registered label, you should have a safety data sheet. So now, um, because of our worker protection regulations, um, we have to have a label. If you have a label, you have to have the label, right? But we also have to provide access to the safety data sheets to our employees, even if we have a label. And even if we're following the instructions on the label, the safety data sheet gives safety information, how long-term health information, right? It has some information that the label does not have. So we always have to provide our employees access to the safety data sheets for the pesticides they're applying and coming into contact with. Um, and then if you don't have a registered label, then you have to, your SDS is your guide for first aid, for PPE, for just all kinds of things, okay? So an employee of UC is any person whose current UC position description or ag experiment station project description includes responsibilities for pest management research and demonstration. So somebody may be getting their paycheck from a county, but they're working on with a &R academics on pesticide research trials. So as far as this policy is concerned, you're an employee of the UC. Oh, I just already said that. I said that. So just in general, the supervisor shall meet the requirements for state regulations. So uh, working alone with pesticides. Oh, that's where that question came up last time. This is not in the policy per se. These are regulations that are in the California code that everybody has to follow. They're not special to us. So I, I'm basically done talking about how UC researchers are special. From here on out, not really. Oh, so from here on out, I'm going to talk about what everybody has to do, including us, and I'll point out where we're a little bit different. So from here forward, I'm talking about what everybody has to do, including us, and I'll point out the exceptions, okay? So we have to have a clothing chain. These are just regulatory sections that we're simply not exempt from, and they're all related to safety of employees. So let's talk about personal protective equipment, because as a supervisor, if you're making the application, you need to wear it. If you're supervising other applicators, you need to make sure they have the appropriate PPE. So let's, I don't know why it says pull four. I'm very sorry. <laughs> it, took me, it took me a second and then I remembered this one was funky. So, okay. So the poll is asking in California, most pesticide handlers have to wear a minimum of what PPE? You can choose all that you think apply. So the options are waterproof gloves, chemical resistant gloves, a respirator, long pants, long sleeve shirt, closed toed shoes, socks, and last but not least, protective eyewear. What do you think are the minimum PPE requirements for a handler in California? Okay. Thank you, Sarah. <coughs> so I wonder. I might just go to my next slide. Um, I don't know, let's go through this. I wanna give you the answers in this format and then we'll reiterate. So waterproof gloves are not minimum requirements. It's chemical resistant gloves, okay? Chemical resistant gloves are waterproof, but not all waterproof gloves are chemical resistant, okay? So it's chemical resistant gloves. 
Um, so respirator is not always required. That's only required if the label if the label indicates. Long pants, long sleeve shirt, closed toed shoes and socks, always required, okay? Um, and protective eyewear required in almost every situation. So here we go. Um, so here, let's reiterate, this is the minimum PPE. So this is Miguel, if you've been to any of my trainings, you've met Miguel. And maybe you've met Miguel in real life. Some people have, I haven't, but anyways, it's such a shame. So Miguel is wearing long sleeve shirt, long pants, socks, closed toed shoes. Um, and he's fine if he's going out into a field to take samples, soil samples, leaf samples, um, do some cultural activities like moving irrigation pipe and things like that. He's wearing the appropriate work clothing, but he is not appropriately dressed or handling pesticides in California. Okay. So he needs to, <laughs> so he needs to also add chemical resistant gloves. I've pictured nitrile gloves because we all recognize them, but they, they, it just depends on which gloves. Okay. The gloves you wear depend and protective eyewear. So for almost every single handling task as an employee, you need to be wearing everything that Miguel's wearing, not the exact same thing, you know, choose your own style, but also protective eyewear and chemical resistant gloves. Okay. So this is found in section 6738 of the California Code of Regulation, which is exactly to say, um, that sometimes the minimum requirements for PPE in California are not found on a pesticide label. These, these labels are usually registered in California, but that there's not a California specific label. They don't put all of our California specific regulations on a federal label, simply not there. So you have to follow at a minimum what the label says, and then you have to follow what the California code says if it's different. So, um, 6738 requires protective eyewear and chemical resistant gloves for most handling tasks and then coveralls for certain pesticides. Okay. So, um, when I say protective eyewear, I'm talking about safety glasses, goggles, or a face shield. So all three of these count as protective eyewear. Um, so all three of these must be Z87.1 compliant. That's a measure of impact resistance. Um, and it is indicated on the plastic part of the protective eyewear. I'll show you in just a second a better picture of this, but they all need to have front side and brow protection. So these are like lab glasses right over here on the bottom left hand side. So they, they do have side protection, like more so than a regular safety glass, right? Uh, safety glasses. But even safety glasses that don't have this full on side shield can have front side and brow protection. They just have to conform to the curvature of your face, right? So my glasses don't conform, they go straight across. So I have a little gap here, a bigger, 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 big gap, right? We're with curved glasses conforming to my face. Uh, there's the same small gap all the way around and that counts as um, side protection. Although I really do prefer these, frankly, they just, they just cover more. They've got the shelf up here and they've got the shield on the side. Perfect. Um, so this is what I mean by Z87. So you can see it right here. Look, I have this fancy thing and I'm going to do it. I'm going to use it right here. It's um, Z87 plus, which is more protective than Z87.1. Okay. So it is raised lettering but it's clear lettering on clear plastic, which is not easy to see. And so you can feel around, but look, there's other raised lettering right here. It's the brand name. So it doesn't tell you anything about it. It's impact resistance. And there's other, there's other letters that I found um, that are raised on the thing. So you have to be, be sure that it says Z87 plus or 0.1. Um, and when you purchase your protective eyewear, you should be able to see in the technical specifications of the eyewear, like the product details, it should tell you if it's Z87.1 um, or plus or something else. Okay, so let me go back to this. So, ooh. <laughs> um, so if your label doesn't say anything about protective eyewear, you get to choose which one of these you use. 
If your label just says protective eyewear, again, you get to choose the best situation for you, the best choice for you. But if your label specifies goggles, you cannot wear safety glasses. This is like the hierarchy of protection, essentially. So if they say goggles or face shield, you can't wear glasses. If they say face shield, you can't wear goggles, okay? So if it's specified on the label what protective eyewear, what specific protective eyewear you have to wear, then you have to wear that. If not, then you get to choose. So um, when I say chemical resistant gloves, I'm talking about gloves that are made of any of these chemical resistant materials. So give me a second here. Um, I wanted to change the color. I can't. I mean, I can, but I don't know how. Here we go. So any of these, I told it to make it red, but it did not listen to me. Okay, so any of these materials listed here are considered chemical resistant. So laminate, oh, I don't have my gloves in here, I'm sorry. Are the silver shield, they go, the uh, space man gloves. Butyl, usually they're black, but not always. Nitrile, you guys are familiar with that. Neoprene are chemical resistant gloves. Natural does not mean natural fabric. It means natural rubber because many of these are in this list are synthetic rubber. So they just didn't take the time or space to add natural rubber. And you know your gloves are natural rubber because they smell like rubber and your hands will smell like rubber for days later. Um, polyethylene is a chemical resistant material. Uh, polyvinyl chloride and Viton. So here, this is very important, all but laminate and polyethylene, okay, these two are actually barrier materials. They're not great with dexterity, but they are a complete barrier to absorption of liquids. <clears throat> so they are not required to have any minimum thickness, whereas all of the other um, chemical resistant materials on this list have to be at least 14 mils thick. So laminate, any thickness, polyethylene, any thickness, everything else has to be a minimum of 14 mils or thicker. But some of you um, wear, oh shoot, sorry. Uh, some of you wear uh, disposable gloves. Oops, I'm not gonna get there yet. Some of you wear disposable gloves. And if you do, they're very likely to be less than 15 mils thick. So you can wear them if they're made out of any of these materials. Usually they're made out of nitrile or neoprene. You need to know how thick they are if they're disposable. Because if they're less than 14 mils thick, then you can wear them for dexterity, like tasks that require dexterity. So like if you've got a small bottle, if you're messing around with nozzles, if you're fixing application equipment, you're measuring out small quantities, you can wear them, but not for more than 15 minutes at a time, okay? So they have to be, you have to change to a different pair of gloves if you're, if you've been wearing those disposables for more than 15 minutes. There are disposable gloves that are nitrile that are 15 mils thick. And so you could wear those for your entire application as long as they don't break or, right, anytime your gloves break, disposable or not, you have to change them. I mean, I think that goes without saying. So there is this provision where you could wear disposable gloves, um, but how long you can wear them depends on the thickness. So coveralls are important because obviously you have to wear them if there's if that is stated on the label and you have to wear them um, when you're handling danger or warning pesticides. So this, this part is the California Code of Regulation. So if the signal word on your EPA registered label is danger or warning, California says you have to wear coveralls. And coveralls can actually be these, um, these tightly woven cotton, um, but then your employer, employer has to provide for laundering. Um, so it could be Tyvek as well, or like some similar material. So, but also you should wear coveralls if in the course of your pesticide application, your clothes are getting wet. So maybe you're not required to wear coveralls by the label or by the signal word. Um, but if you are out there making an application and your clothes, your work clothes are getting wet, you should be wearing a coverall. Don't, don't get your, if your work clothes are getting wet with pesticides, then those pesticides are absorbing into your skin. And that's, that's not what's supposed to happen. So just be cognizant. If you're, 
in an open cab and you're doing some air blast spray, you're probably gonna get wet and you're gonna need some coveralls. So let's put our knowledge to the test. I just got a really quick quiz for you. So let, this is my PPE statement. Um, so Miguel is wearing long sleeve shirt, long pants, socks, shoes. Um, he's gonna add some protective eyewear. He's got chemical resistant gloves in category A, which is all of the material. So nitrile is fine. Um, it says down here, he needs a dust mist, NIOSH approved respirator. Okay. Well, is that it? We like, we checked off this, 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 and this. Is there anything else that Miguel is supposed to be wearing or is he finished? He's ready to make this application. Tell me in the chat, please. Okay, so Sarah says, Sarah and Ryan say coveralls. Christina says chemical resistant apron. Okay, so Christina, if you were mixing and loading, then yes, a chemical resistant apron. Um, so a lot of people are saying coveralls and that's true because he's applying a signal word with the EPA registered label says danger. So even though it's not listed on the label, there are still California requirements that come into play. Let me just give you a plug. So my staff and I are doing monthly webinars. And so if on pesticide safety topics, so if you need continuing education, um, if you just want to know more about this, um, come to our webinar. So we'll, we'll give you the link in just a minute to find us. Um, so I just gone through all of this. So we review all different concepts like spills and storage and transportation, PPE. We talk about all these awesome topics and uh, we're fun and it's only an hour. So you only have to listen to us for an hour at a time. So I've gone through, you know, all these PPE requirements like on the label and California, but sometimes you don't have a label. Okay. So here, let me just step back and say, if you're using an EPA registered label, it's not registered in California, so it's experimental, but you have a label, then follow the label required PPE and the California regulations, okay? So um, keep that in mind. So if you do actually have a label, even if you're using it off label or in conflict with the label, then follow the label instructions and then the California code that I just told you. But if you are working with um, an unregistered pesticide, then you need to look at the safety data sheet essentially for some hazard statements. Um, and then that'll give you some indications for what type of PPE you wear. But just keep in mind, you're always going to be wearing long sleeve shirt, long pants, socks, closed toed shoes, protective eyewear, chemical resistant gloves. That is your minimum. Okay. Registered, unregistered, organic, not organic. That is the minimum that you should be wearing when you're applying pesticides. So if you don't have a registered label, you have to wear at least the minimum PPE, period. That's it. End of story. There's no, like, there's no exceptions to the minimum. I'm sorry. When you're using an unregistered pesticide, just protect yourself. So, but it's also important to check section two of the safety data sheet. It has hazards identification. So it has like, hazard statements that are equivalent to label statements on precautionary statements. So you can see the potential hazards by each route of exposure. So I think that I have um, some examples. So if your hazard statements are equivalent to category one for eye or skin damage, category one is a danger or danger poison pesticide. Category one is the most toxic. So if you look at the safety data sheet and you have some information that says um, um, fatal or fatal if absorbed into the skin, that's category one, okay? That's bad. Maybe fatal if absorbed in, onto the skin. Um, corrosive causes extreme eye damage. Those are equip. Those are hazard statements that are equivalent to category one, which means everything that you're wearing as a minimum is not enough anymore. Okay, you need to add coveralls over your long sleeve shirt and long pants. You're already wearing protective eyewear, chemical resistant gloves, and socks. 
But now in addition to just your regular work boots, you are going to be, you are going to be wearing chemical resistant footwear. If your pesticide says fatal if absorbed into the skin, don't wear leather boots. I mean, just wear the rubber boots, okay, please. Um, and then always chemical resistant headgear for overhead exposure, which means if spray is gonna be falling onto your head, okay? So like in an air blast situation, that's a possibility. Um, and then when you're mixing and loading, use a chemical resistant apron and then add that face shield for the mixing and loading, you know, for splash control. So if you have hazard statements on an SDS that are equivalent to category one for systemic toxicity, meaning um, fatal if inhaled, fatal if swallowed, or may be fatal if inhaled, or may be fatal if swallowed. Like if this is fatal or irreversible in reference to inhalation or ingestion, you are dealing with a category one pesticide and you need, and the minimum is just not enough. It's simply not enough. So you're already wearing your long sleeve shirt, long pants, protective eyewear, chemical resistant gloves, socks, and closed toed shoes. You need to add respiratory protection. You have to be fit tested for it, but you need to wear a respirator. Okay. And I would suggest uh, elastomeric with the OV cartridges with the P100 filter on top. That's, that's what I'm going to tell you, because that's the most protective that you can get. And you don't know, you don't have a label statement to identify the exact respirator. And then again, um, chemical resistant headgear for overhead exposure. So if it's going to spray on top of your head, then protect your head. I mean, hello. And then um, when mixing and loading, always use a chemical resistant apron and then that face shield. Okay. So Oh, I gave you an example. Look, so this is Gramoxone on this Parabot. Okay, so you know that this is bad stuff. So section two is always hazards identification. Then they have these hazard statements. So these, if you have a label, precautionary statements are going to be essentially the same as these hazard statements. They're very equivalent. So um, fatal if, maybe fatal if, corrosive causes irreversible damage, that's equivalent to category one. Minimum PPE is not enough, okay? So this one says, uh, maybe corrosive to metals. <laughs> I mean, I've never seen a hazard statement like this before. The paraquat is real serious. Toxic if swallowed, causes serious eye damage. Fatal if inhaled. If you're not wearing a respirator, you, you should absolutely not go anywhere near this pesticide. So, you know, our unregistered pesticides, we don't know exactly what they, you know, we just, don't have all the same information. So we have to make some educated decisions. So anyways, I'm gonna um, quietly step off my soapbox because I have a lot of feelings about this. It looks like there might be a question. Do I need to, is this a good time to address it? Yeah. So the question is um, what qualifies as chemical resistant headgear? Oh, okay. Um, that's a good question. Um, so the, I wish I had one here. So like those hard hats that are made out of, um, Gosh, I don't know what they're made out of, but they're chemical resistant. You can find them where you find your PPE. So it's not just a regular construction hard hat, although those are probably chemical resistant. But if you want to be sure, uh, look at the technical specifications and make sure that they're chemical resistant um, and you can buy them where you buy your regular PPE. Um, that's headgear. So there are other, like there are um, these hats that are made out of the same thing as like those rain suits. Like they're probably made out of PVC, frankly, which is chemical resistant. So anything on that list of chemical resistant gloves, those are chemical resistant materials. So like if you find a suit made of PVC or neoprene, I don't know, not a wetsuit though. Um, those are chemical resistant. So there are hats that are made, I believe out of uh, PVC, but they're like a little bit floppy. So they're imperfect. You can wear those or you can wear the hard hat. The problem with the hard hat is, you know, the brim comes out, but then your neck is exposed. So then I tell people to wear the coveralls with the hood put the hood over the hat. We could wear it the other way around too. So you could put the hood on and then the hat on. However, it fits better and it's more stable. So yeah, that's a good question. So uh, we're getting into training requirements. So uh, basically people have to be trained in order to work with pesticides or around pesticides. I mean, I'll give you the details, but that's, that's the gist of it. Okay. 
So do you have any unlicensed pesticide applicators that work under your supervision? So for example, you're a researcher, uh, you have a QAC in research and demonstration, and then you have like two people who um, uh, work on some of your sprays. They're out in the field with you when you're making the application, they're handing you the different bottles, they're switching out the jugs on your small plot trials. Um, well, those people have to be trained, okay? They need to be trained annually. So how about, do you have field workers that work under your supervision? So people who are working in a field where pesticides have been applied, um, they're uh, pulling weeds, they're checking traps, they're taking soil samples, they're moving irrigation pipe. They're field workers. They have to be trained every year on pesticide safety. So you must include information on pesticide hazards and safety prior to the handling of any pesticides. Basically, you have to um, be compliant with section 6724 and 6764, which are the training regulations. So I have a diagram of a treated field. I don't know if Katrina wants to, I can't remember if you did this last time, but if you wanna chime in, then unmute and then just do it. Otherwise I can, I can proceed. So um, let me give Katrina a second to tell me what to do. Uh, I'll let you proceed, Lisa. I, this slide wasn't in the presentation last time, so I don't quite recognize it, although I do know what a treated field is. <laughs> okay. So. Okay, then I misunderstood, and that's totally fine. So a treated field, this is a definition. This is very important. A treated field is a definition that is specific to an ag situation. So if you're doing research on a non-ag commodity, non-production commodity, there's no treated field, okay? But if you are, then there is. So if you're working in walnuts or if you're working in a nursery setting and you're producing ornamental plants, that's ag, okay? So a field that has been treated with a pesticide or has had a restricted entry interval in effect in the last 30 days, that's a treated field. And when somebody's, one of your employees, if you or an employee are in a treated field, they have to have some training prior to entering that field. So during a pesticide application, so this is like, as we go from left to left to, left to right on the screen, time is going forward, okay? And so during the pesticide application, the only people who can be in that field during the pesticide application are people who either have a certificate, you know, QAL, QAC, or they're trained as a pesticide handler, okay? If you're in the field, but you're not um, applying the pesticide, you still have to be trained as a handler. You can't be like swapping out like the jugs on your research backpack sprayer and not be trained as a handler. And you also gotta be wearing PPE, okay? So the minimum age for pesticide handlers are, uh, it's 18. I don't think that's an issue here at UC. Not to say that, you know, anyways, I'm not gonna say that. So during, so as soon as the application is over, um, we, what starts is a restricted entry interval and that's mostly an ag construct. So um, for, I applied thiamethoxam and strawberries, I don't know, whatever. Um, and my restricted entry interval is 24 hours. So during, from the time that the application com is completed for the next 24 hours, there's a restricted entry interval, meaning we notify all workers not to enter. And if we need somebody to enter, then they have to at a minimum have early entry training. So if you've already had handler training, you're, you have already had early entry training. Pesticide handler training is like QAC or QAL is like the Cadillac and then pesticide handler, Cadillac being good. Um, when I was growing up, that was like the gold standard. So uh, pesticide handler is like the Volkswagen. No, I don't want to rank people. I'm just saying it's like a higher higher level of training. Doesn't make your doesn't make you better, but it's just like you have more training as a handler than you do as an early entry employee. So, okay, whatever. So, and you have to be at least 18 years old to enter the restricted entry interval into the field during the restricted entry interval. But let me just be clear: nobody is to enter the field during restricted entry interval unless you have PPE training you're at least 18 and you have a good reason. 
You don't just send people into the field during the restricted entry interval. There's a very good reason why that entry is restricted. Okay, for safety. So the REI has expired. Then for the next 30 days, oh, this isn't exactly, okay. For the next 30 days after the REI expires, you can't enter the field to do any work unless you've at least had field worker training. And then if, you know, 30 days after the REI expires, you don't make any more pesticide applications, then anybody can enter. So there's certain times during the season when we don't need this pesticide specific training because pesticides haven't recently been applied. Oh gosh. So this is a treated field during the pesticide application, during the restricted entry interval, and then 30 days after that REI has expired. That's a treated field, meaning somebody has to have certain level of training to be in that field at all, period. Um, but after that, it's not a treated field. People can go in, take leaf samples, you know, whatever. But the thing is, most of the time you're making multiple applications in a season. So that 30 day cycle is starting over and over and over. That 30 plus day cycle is starting over and over and over again. So is there, are there any questions on who needs to be trained or what's a treated field? Sarah is answering a question right now in, in the Q&A about whether you need pesticide handler or field worker training if you have a QAC or QAL. And this question did come up in the last webinar. So maybe okay. I'll let you answer that. Yeah, so um, if you have a QAL or a QAC, you're considered trained. Um, so this is, this is very specifically for people who do not have a QAL or a QAC. I mean, you still are not supposed to go in during the REI, right? Without having PPE and a good reason, but you don't have to have the training, okay? Because you're already trained. QAL, QAC is a higher level of training. You know more, um, you've been trained on more, not that you know more, you've been trained on more concepts. Yeah. Um, any other questions that have come up? Okay, so uh, field work during pesticide applications. Field work is not permitted in a field where a pesticide application is, hand, is happening. So if you are uh, trained as a field worker, I know that you are, right? You're trained because otherwise you wouldn't be going to a treated field. You go out to the field and you're supposed to be, I don't know, um, collecting insects. But you see like in the far corner of the field, somebody's making a pesticide application. Should you go into that field? Yes or no? You can tell me in the chat. I mean, say it out loud. I'm not going to hear it, but you could also tell me in the chat. So if you go to collect insects in a field and you find that, you know, it's a far corner, but it's the same field, um, somebody's making an application. No, you absolutely cannot enter that field. And if your supervisor tells you to enter the field, you say, nope, somebody's applying pesticides. I'm not going in there. I'm not supposed to. It's against the law. This is not safe. Um, okay, so then the reverse situation is also true. So you arrive at a field to make an application and in the far corner, you see a group of employees or a person. It just can be any person, people, because um, we're all people and um, they're collecting insects. And then you, you, can't, you can't start that application if there are other people in the field. You guys need to have a conversation. Like, okay, how long are you be out here with these insects? Okay, because I need to make this application. And where are you going on? Okay. So let me be clear, no field work when a pesticide is being applied. The only people in the field during that application are people who are participating in the application and essential to the application and they either have a QAL, QAC or pesticide handler training. Okay, so I have a quick poll for you. Um, we don't need to wait for all of the people on this one. I just wanna get a general sense. Okay. So this poll is asking, do you have students that work for you in a treated field that are compensated either with an hourly wage or with credit towards their degree? Yes or no? Okay, so there's no right or wrong answer. It's just simply a polling question. So it looks like it just depends, right? So if you do have students who are working like grad students, undergrads, it doesn't matter. If that student is a person, which I'm pretty sure they all are. I don't think we have any robot students yet. So we have students who are human beings 
And if they're out there doing work and they're getting paid for that work, they're employees, they are not volunteers, they're employees in that they're compensated either with money or with credit or I don't know what else. I, I don't want to envision that, but um, they're employees, meaning if they're out there doing field work in a treated field, they have to, at a minimum, have field worker training. The training that they get is sort of equivalent to the work that they're going to be doing, right? So they have to have this annual pesticide safety training. Okay. So training resources, you know, contact us. Don't go to that website. I don't have training resources there. They're not up to date. Sorry. But you can email us at OPIC. Um, we don't have... We don't have everything that everybody needs. I'm just gonna say that. So, and that's becoming clear to me recently, but anyways, we also don't have funding to do what we're supposed to do. So, okay. So if you need training resources, then, I mean, you can get handler and field worker training from outside safety trainers. So MVP up in Woodland, um, there's some people in the Valley as well. So you're, you're welcome to go outside. I'm not the one-stop shop all training. Um, I have done a field worker and handler training for UC employees. Um, it was sort of a little outside of my regularly scheduled trainings, but it was necessary. And so we're trying to find ways to make that more available. But also people can get training outside the UC as well. I'm not going to hurt my feelings. So um, Ryan has a question on AEZs in the chat. So let me see if you're spraying and somebody rides a bike past. Okay. So irrespective of the AEZ, I'm going to, you know what, Ryan, I mean, that's a good point, but I'm going to ignore the AEZ because we have this regulation in California. I think it's 6614 and it has a lot of words in it, but essentially it says you cannot start an application or continue an application if there is a possibility that you will, your spray will come into contact with people that are not participating in the application. So field workers, bystanders, bike riders. So if your spray is gonna come into contact with people who are not involved in the application or property of whomever, you know, just things or pets and wild animals. So people, pets and uh, people, animals and things then you have to stop your application. So you can't start an application if there's a possibility that you're gonna drift um, and touch people, things, and animals. And if you've started your application and things are going fine, but the wind changes and it turns out you think there's a possibility that your spray is gonna come into contact with the neighbor, people in the neighboring field, then you can't continue that application until you've ensured that you're not going to harm other people. So it's irrespective of, you know, this regulation is irrespective of distance. It doesn't matter if you're in the same field, if you're in a neighboring field, or if you're 100 feet down the road. Your spray can't come into contact with people who aren't involved in the application, um, any kind of an animal, domesticated or not, and things like cars, houses, um, whatever. So I hope that that answers your question. But because it's just like way more encompassing than the AEZ. The AEZ gets a little complicated. Um, so try not to talk about it ever. <laughs> so I just want to remind you of the requirements for a pesticide safety information series, safety data sheets, labels, and a bunch of other acronyms. Um, okay. Pesticide labels, labeling. Um, you have to provide specific information on, to, these are for your handlers, right? So this is what you're supposed to do as a supervisor, provide specific information on how to apply the formulated product, how to protect handlers and field workers during the application. And then you have to provide safety data sheets for all recent pesticide applications. So safety data sheets provide hazard, emergency medical treatment and other safety information. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm saying this all wrong. So pesticide labels give you specific information on how to apply the product, right? The safety data sheet provides hazard and emergency medical treatment. And so both are required. So if you don't have a label because you're doing an experimental pesticide research, well, then you have to have the safety data sheet and some sort of experimental protocol, right? Okay. But the label is always the primary document. The safety data sheet is required to be displayed. Yes, displayed. Um, 
but that's not what's going to tell you how to mix the pesticide and what specific PPE you need for every situation. Okay, so you need both of those pieces of information. So safety data sheets all have these sections and in this order. And we talked about section two on hazards identification already. Um, and so um, sometimes the signal words on a label doesn't match the signal word on the safety data sheet. So that's why I say, so for example, this is just Dacanil um, here, it's caution on the EPA registered label, but here on the safety data sheet, it's danger, okay? If you have a label, that's your primary document, and then you follow this signal word because they come from different places. This signal word is talking about you as the pesticide handler, what the acute potential acute toxicity is to you, the person mixing, loading, and applying the pesticide. This signal word is like if it's corrosive to metal or if it's an environmental hazard or something like this. So it's a signal word on the label. If you have a label, you follow the label signal word. So any information you have on the label, that is primary. SDS is supplemental to that. Okay, not in place of. But if you don't have a label, um, then you have to rely exclusively on the safety data sheet. So um, we have these things called pesticide safety information series, the A8 for ag handlers and the A9 for field workers, which is ag, or also sometimes people are using the N8, which is non-ag for handlers. This is California's hazard communication system for our field workers and our pesticide handlers. So it says in these documents, you have the right to look at pesticide use records, applicable pesticide safety and series leaflets and safety data sheets for all the pesticides used where you work in the last two years. And so here's where these records are kept. So you have to tell people that, the, that this pesticide safety information series tells them this, the records are keep, kept here, and then you have to display this pesticide safety information series. So a cop, whereas a copy of the label um, also has to be um, available at each use site. So the label or whatever experimental protocol that you're using. So if you don't have a label because you're using a numbered compound, presumably you have an experimental protocol to help you, um, you know, mix it properly and get the right rate. So whatever, either the label or that experimental protocol has to be available at each use site. So this is a mixed load site. Here's the storage. So maybe you're you know, measuring it out at the storage. If you're using that pesticide um, or your employees are, then you have to have the label available. So there are central displays and you have to provide application specific information and safety data sheets. So I don't wanna go into like the nitty gritty details of this, but this is, let me see if I have another picture after this. No, I don't, of course not. Um, there's application specific information, which is detailed in the pesticide safety information series. Basically it's a record of all recent applications because that allows employees. So these are two employees are getting ready to go into a field and do field work. They don't have PPE on because they're not handling pesticides. So they're looking at the list of recently applied pesticides to make sure the field that they are supposed to enter does, is not, does not have a restricted entry interval in effect at that time, okay? So um, any questions on when to provide labels or safety data sheets? Basically you have to have them both. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions. So I wanna go into re-entry and posting requirements. I probably won't go into all the details on this because a lot of times the details don't apply to the majority of people. But if you do have follow-up questions, I would like to hear them. So we talked about the restricted entry interval. Um, no person shall enter any treated area with a pesticide, area treated with the pesticide, um, unless they are following the label directions for early entry. So um, if there's a 24 hour restricted entry interval, then you're not gonna enter the field during that 24 hour period, unless you're following label instructions for PPE, um, for the specific tasks you're allowed to do. You have to be 18 and you have to be properly trained. If you have a QAL or QAC, you're trained. You're already, you're trained up. Okay, so there are certain pesticide active ingredients in California that have their state specific 
restricted entry interval. And most of these don't apply to us because they're not commonly used or they're no longer registered or allowed. But I did want to point this one out. So sulfur, this one might apply to some of you in the room. I'm not sure. So sulfur for grapes here, it says it's three days. The H is a footnote. All of these numbers are in days. This is not hours. So here it says the REI for sulfur being applied to grapes is three days, which is significantly longer than the label tells you, right? So don't worry, go to the footnote. It's very specific circumstances. So um, the REI for sulfur only applies in the Central Valley. So it lists out the counties um, and it's May 15th through harvest or March and April down in Riverside because it's the south end of the valley. So um, so sometimes, and then this um, comite and omite also, they have some specific um, restricted entry intervals. So if you recognize any of these active ingredients, you need to refer to this list. And if the restricted entry interval on this list um, is more strict than what the label says, then you have to do the more strict restricted entry interval. So most of the time we're gonna find our restricted entry interval on in the ag use requirements box. So this is a very ag construct. So if you're doing research in an ag production commodity, then this, this message is for you. So here, um, let me see. Okay, so here it says, do not allow in, do not enter or allow worker entry into treated areas during the restricted enter, entry interval of 24 hours, except for the following. Onions, garlic, and horseradish is 48 hours. So you have to go to the ag use requirements box so to know like what the restricted entry interval is. But here, this ag use requirements box says the REI for each crop is listed in the directions for you. So there's too many different REIs to list here. So the first stop is ag use requirements to figure out if the REI is there or if you need to go somewhere else. And then the ag use requirements box is going to tell you if posting is required by the label. Posting is a sign that says do not enter until the REI is over, right? This, this particular pesticide says notify workers of the application by warning them orally. We always notify people orally and by posting warning signs. So if it says and by posting warning signs, that means you have to post, you know, you have to post a warning sign. This particular pesticide doesn't say anything at all about posting, the second one here, which means the label itself doesn't require posting. That doesn't mean that posting's not required, it's just the label doesn't require it. So field posting, there are California, it's because there's California requirements. So uh, the field posting requirements are based on the label and on California code. So it gets a little complicated. So, okay, I want to, let's not do the poll because I see I'm running out of time. So this sign is the California sign. It's important that you're using a sign with the skull and crossbones, not the angry rancher, because that is a federal sign. It's not a keep out sign. It's not a no trespassing sign. It's an illegal sign. So don't use it. You see them, don't use them. Just don't buy them. You can buy them on Gamblers, but don't. Just really never buy them. So in California, we have our own specific posting signs. They have a skull and crossbones. Everything else about the sign is essentially the same. This one's particularly dirty, so not a great example, but it says danger, pesticides, keep out. And it's in English and in Spanish. Um, you have to be able, a person with regular eyesight or corrected eyesight has to be able to read it from 25 feet. So if you're making a pesticide application in a greenhouse, you have to post the sign during the REI, period. If you're making a pesticide application in like a hoop house, like where we grow some of our raspberries, um, or in a mushroom house, something that's not completely enclosed. If the REI on the label is greater than four hours, you have to post the sign. Well, if the label requires posting, like we saw in the previous slide, obviously you have to post the sign during the restricted entry interval. And then there's this other thing. If the REI on the label is greater than 48 hours, you have to post a sign. So sometimes more than one of these things is correct. It's true, not correct, it's true. Um, so if any of these things are true, you have to post this sign, okay? There's also signs that have more information that are required at the bottom. And these are required if your REI is greater than seven days. 
You can use these even when they're not required, but if you use a sign that has blanks to be filled in, you have to fill in the blanks. The ag commissioner, like the inspectors, the county inspectors, they don't like empty blanks. They, they are, they're not going to walk past it. They're going to say something. Um, they're going to, you know, follow up with you about it. So if you choose to use the sign, even if you don't need to, um, you still have to fill in the blanks. So it's, you have to say the pesticide, the grower, which means just the person responsible, and when the REI expires. Um, I'm sure most people are not applying soil fumigants in there, but if you are, then you probably already know this. There's a special posting sign for soil fumigants, and then there's a, a buffer zone posting for the soil fumigants. And then if you're applying pesticides in an irrigation system, we have an extra sign that's California specific that needs to be used. So if you're applying, if you're chemigating, applying in an irrigation system, and the signal word on the pesticide label is danger, then you have to post whatever sign is required, like the regular sign, and then you have to add the irrigation sign. So I won't go into this. So I'm going to tell you what's wrong with these pictures. One, you can barely see this. Two, if you could see it, it's the wrong sign. This is the federal sign. Three, um, the RA expired in 1999, meaning that it's been up for a long time. It's not really being used for to indicate a restricted entry interval. What's wrong with this sign is that I was allowed to enter this field even though the sign was up. The REI had expired, but I should not have been able to enter this field. We are never allowed to make an employee enter a field where any of these field posting signs are, okay? Because the rule is don't go in there when the sign is posted. So then if you tell them, oh, this time it's fine, then they don't, they don't know when it's okay and when it's not, and they can't actually make a good decision on how to protect themselves, which is to say that you can't just leave the REI signs up. Once the REI expires, you can remove the sign or you can wait three days after that expiration. Only three days though. But so long as the sign is up, nobody uh, without early entry credentials can enter that field, period. Okay. So it just sort of behooves you to take it down when it's a, when, you know, at, whenever the REI is done. Um, so when you're making non-ag or urban areas, so I've been talking about ag specific stuff, uh, notify the owners or residents of the treated property with information indicating the nature of the treatment, time and date of the treatment, and any special instructions. Usually for non-ag areas, the, you know, you can't let people enter the area until the sprays have dried. Um, that's typically what we say. So if you don't have a pesticide label to tell you what the restricted entry interval is, you need to make some educated decisions here. So we talked about using the safety data sheet. You can always refer to the hazards statements in section two of the safety data sheet. If they say fatal if inhaled, well, four hours is not a long enough REI. But you, you kind of have to guess what it is, but just be conservative because you don't want to expose people to too high a uh, concentration of residues if that's really not necessary. So the minimum, if you don't have a label, the minimum is four hours. Four hour REI is minimum for anything that doesn't have, you know, a registered label. But again, please add time if you notice that the hazard statement is alarming or, you know, four hours is the minimum. It's not the rule. It's simply the, uh, the bare minimum that you should be doing. Okay. So if it's, if the hazard statements don't cause you any concern at all, then four hours is fine. But if they are harmful, corrosive, fatal, maybe fatal, irreversible, any of those words that you see in the hazard statements, yeah, I'll, I'll go for like 24 to 48 hours minimum. Okay. Um, and then non-ag and urban areas um, don't enter um, for two hours or until the treated area has dried. Um, but when you're using um, solid formulations, um, just don't enter the area during the application. And th these are just the minimum. You can always increase the level of safety. Standard industry care and practice should be observed. So for your own protection, 
when you're entering um, cooperators field, either to make a pesticide application or um, maybe you're just going to do a farm call. So I would just verify with that farm owner or just your cooperator, um, like, is there, you know, when was the last time this was sprayed? You want to know what the restricted entry interval is and if it has passed. So you don't want to be entering a field to do a farm call if there's an REI that's still in effect because it's not safe for you. You don't have the PPE. You don't know anything about the pesticide. So double check any usual points of entry for REI warning signs. But please remember that we don't always have to post a warning sign, only in certain circumstances. So you could be walking into a field that has an REI in effect, but there's no warning sign. So you don't always know. So you have the, you have the right to check uh, the application specific information, which employees have the right to do as well. Um, but you may not know where that is if you're working with a cooperator and that's not your regular place that you're working. So check with them. And then follow up on any illnesses that you may, like if you suspect you went into a field, you went into a field and later that day you're feeling sick, you know, don't, don't brush it off. That's what I'm saying. Um, okay, so it's 1153. I've had a couple of requests for some of these optional topics. Um, I want to talk just real briefly about, um, I'm going to escape out of here for a second. Um, organic pesticides, because that's one that I promised to say something about. And then um, I can talk just briefly about pesticide applications near schools. I don't know, I don't remember if the handouts include any of that. Sorry, I'm looking for the right slides. Okay, just I just want to really quickly talk about organics because it came up. I'm not going to tell you everything there is to know about organic pesticide research. I'm going to tell you, I'm just going to tell you like what the policy says essentially. So, or what my recommendations are. So um, like the CCOF or the national organic program, whatever the, the certifier needs to make, you need to make sure that your organic certifier is okay with whatever pesticides you're putting out there, even if they're certified organic. Um, if it's not part of their farm plan, um, then the certifier may not approve it. So that really the grower needs to be checking with their third party certifier to make sure they're okay with you, you all making these applications, even if they're organically approved. So these are a list of chemicals that are exempt from the requirement of a registration. Okay, they're called the 25B list, they're lower toxicity products. So if these are the active ingredients, and there's no other active ingredient not on this list in that product, then technically it doesn't have to be registered, but it is not exempt, is not automatically exempt from a tolerance. So if you're applying stuff to food, like animal food or human food or drink, um, then it has to either have a registration or exemption from registration, tolerance or tolerance exemption, otherwise it's experimental. So if you don't have a registration or exemption from registration, that's fine. You can do that. It's an experimental trial. But you, you are not necessarily exempt from a tolerance with these lower toxicity materials. You do have to check and make sure you have a tolerance or an exemption from a tolerance. Uh, Katrina has been doing a lot of that searching recently. So we can sort of help identify if you are exempt from a tolerance. But that's just something to check. Um, Typically, you want to keep your organically approved or certified materials separate um, in your pesticide storage, just so you don't actually grab, you know, conventional material and apply it to certified organic land. That would not be good. Um, so Omri is a great place to check for organic materials, um, but it is a paid service, meaning if the product, if the company doesn't pay to be on the Omri list, then it's not on the OMRI list, even if it's organically approved. So things on the OMRI list are organically approved, but they're it's a subset of the materials that are organically approved. But it's a good search. And then the Washington State Department of Ag, um, they maintain a list. It's a PDF list. I assume that they update it fairly regularly uh, with registered products that are that are compliant with the National Organic Program re requirements. But again, just because it's organically approved, it also has to be part of like the organic farm plan. Um, and then the certifier has to be okay with that being out there on the certified organic land. 